the Free Britney movement has the attention of celebrities, politicians, and the general public. It is all about conservatorships. What are these? And how do we protect ourselves from getting in a similar situation? Today, we learn more about conservatorships. Thanks for listening and thanks for subscribing to Learning More. Today, we are talking about conservatorships. Okay, you've heard this in the news a lot, specifically with Britney Spears is related to the free Britney and what's going on with, with her and her dad and her family. Well, I, I got to wondering, okay, what exactly is this? What is a conservatorship? How does this happen? And how did Britney get to this point? What What is going on with all of this? So I decided to reach out to a professor of law at the University of Virginia. I am joined today by Naomi Khan. Thank you for joining me, Naomi. Happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, we, we got to just jump right into this. What is a conservatorship? A conservatorship is when a court appoints one person to make decisions for another person. So a conservatorship, some states it's called a guardianship, but we're talking about the same concept. That is, there's someone who has the legal authority to make decisions on behalf of someone else. And conservatorships and guardianships can take two different forms. Um, first is there can be a conservatorship of the estate. That is when the conservator has authority to make financial decisions on behalf of someone. The second type is sometimes called a guardianship, but it's a guardianship or conservatorship of the person. And that's when the conservator has the ability to make all kinds of personal decisions on behalf of someone, including health decision making. The conservator is essentially the guardian, the person that has control. Is that person court appointed? Yes. This whole process starts when someone who is interested in the person who later becomes subject to the guardianship, when someone files a petition with a court. So it this is only done through a court order. So a court must order the conservatorship to start. In the absence of a court order or court proceeding starting, there is not a legally appointed guardian. It's not always a person, right? It's sometimes, it, it can be a, a, like an organization, the government essentially stepping in. Absolutely. It's often a family member because that's a person who will know the person subject to the conservatorship the best. Um, and of course, in Britney Spears' case, it started off with her father being both the conservator of her person, her, her personal decision making, as well as her financial decisions. But it doesn't have to be an individual. It might sometimes be a public entity, or it could also be a business. There are, at, at one point, Bessemer Trust was going to step in to act as a conservator for Britney Spears. So it might also hmm. be a business. So, so there are different options. I'll refer to a person, but that person doesn't have to be an actual human being. That person could be a business or could be the public. Okay, looking at the Britney thing, right? You see her performing in Vegas, you see her recording music and doing interviews and doing all of these other projects. Uh -huh. Well, from what I understand of conservatorship is that it's somebody that's essentially, they, they can't make their own decisions. They're yes. incapable of making those decisions. It seems to me like, I mean, she's doing all of these things. How, how is it? that that happened. You're absolutely right. Generally, a court will appoint a conservator for someone who is unable to to manage their their, their own their own life uh, or unable to make to manage making their own decisions about finances or or healthcare or similar decisions that need to be made. We don't know the full situation. We know the public situation. We've seen and heard Britney Spears. And more recently, we've heard Britney Spears talk about the impact of the conservatorship on her and her life. But when the conservatorship started, there would have had to have been a petition filed and there would be there would be a court hearing 
where there would be evidence produced to explain why it was believed that Brittany needed a conservatorship. Uh, But yeah, typically conservatorships are not appointed for people who are very much in the public, who are, as, as she has explained, doing their own choreography and teaching other people that choreography and uh, uh, for people who seem to be as much in control of their own decision-making as she does. So she's not your typical person subject to a conservatorship. So who, okay. So who would be that person that's the, the the typical person well I mean the the typical person is someone who has been incapacitated by age or by some kind of a mental illness and is incapable of making their own decisions um, so often it is someone who has advanced dementia. Um, uh, it's, it's often old. We, we often think of this as being for older people. I mean, I'll also say that uh, guardianships are often established for minor children, that is for children under the age of 18, if their parents have died. Someone, a guardian, has to take care of the children. So we also see guardianships for children. Oh, the other thing here is with this Brittany case with like, uh, I think of like Amanda Bynes as well. I mean, these are highly paid people for the work that they do. Yeah. Where, where does the money go? <laughs> well, because this was a conservatorship of the estate as well as of the person. So a full conservatorship, it is up to the conservator that is in this case, Jamie it, it was Jamie Spears no longer, but it, it was Britney mm-hmm. Spears' father who was responsible for managing all of the money that came in. Now, I should say con- conservators who are often, as, as is true here, a family member, do have legal obligations to act in the best interests of the person for whom they are the conservator. They can't just do whatever they want to with the money, they have as, as lo- they, they have duties of loyalty. They have uh, f- fiduciary responsibilities. Being being a conservator is generally it's a lot of work. Uh, we can imagine that managing mm-hmm. Britney Spears' financial issues oh, yeah. has been a lot of work. Conservators, of course, as we know, can get paid for the work they do, but they are responsible. They have legal obligations to be responsible to report in most states to report to the courts on how they are managing the conservatorship. So how does the court ensure that the conservator is acting on the best interest of the incapacitated person? Well, let me let me let me step back here for a moment and say that the each state and actually DC, each, each jurisdiction has its own laws on how oh, a conservatorship okay. is conducted and how often the conservator needs to visit the person subject to the conservatorship, how Mm. often reports need to be filed with the court. So there's enormous variation from state to state as to just what the obligations are. That being said, all states would say that the conservator is supposed to be acting in the best interests of the person subject to the conservatorship. Uh, so that's that's a basic obligation. What that means, however, varies from state to state. So one state might say that the guardian or conservator needs to visit the person subject to the conservatorship at least once a month, may be obligated to file reports with the court every six months. Um, Often it's every year, but typically there there are obligations to check in on the person subject to the conservatorship and to file accountings with the the court. Well, that makes me think of like taxes and things like that. So the, the, the ward or the, uh, the conservator is taking care of all of the accounting, all of the taxes. What happens if there's some sort of, uh, let's say something, a bad investment or something that was maybe intentionally, or, you know, they're 
taking money out, whatever it is. What happens to the conservator if, if that's the case? If the conservator deliberately undercuts or intentionally does something that is contrary to the best interests of the person subject to the conservatorship, then st- states have, there are various procedures. Um, one is there may be a guardianship assistance program in a jurisdiction where a complaint can be filed. Um, I, I, any, I, I, where, where, where there's questions about what the conservator is doing, um, an interested person can file with the court to terminate the conservatorship. So someone who is interested in the well-being of the person subject to the conservatorship can raise questions about the actions of the conservator. Is there risk for that conservator as, as well? There are risks for the conservator, and often conservators have to post some kind of an insurance policy that they'll lose that bond, they'll lose that money if it's found that they've mismanaged the financial issues of the person subject to the conservatorship. So they may, where where there's been an egregious abuse, they may be personally liable for their abuse of the guardianship, for their intentionally doing something that is not in the best interests of the conservatee. So, so there is, there are some, there are some risks. And in fact, one, one of the problems is that conservators don't know just what they're undertaking when they agree to become a conservator. Uh, California states often have various information forms, uh, booklets to provide to conservators to give them some information about just what it means to act as a conservator. And certainly many organizations have this type of a handbook that, um, uh, that they can give. Um, California actually has on the California uh, court website a handbook for conservators from the Judicial Council of California that sets out um, uh, just what what the obligations of a conservator are and what it means to be a conservator. And so it's things like duties of the conservator. It explains the types of conservatorships, Mm -hmm. talks about how to get qualified to serve as a conservator. It also, for that matter, talks about the the rights of the person subject to the conservatorship. And it sets out the differences between a conservatorship of the person and a conservatorship of the estate. And it also explains what the role of the court is in monitoring. And the, this pamphlet, however, um, it would be quite hard to do in, in one reading. It's, oh, I um, bet. <laughs> it's, it's quite, it's, it's 318 pages. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> I mean, intimidating, even jeez. as a lawyer who teaches aging and the law. Oh, do you think of working? I mean, it's got lots and lots of information. But 300 pages of information for someone who's seeking to act as a conservator. It's a lot to read. Oh, yeah. And to plow through. Well, I, I would think, I mean, okay, if somebody is, is mentally incapacitated you, and you're a family member of that person, not only do you have the, the emotional stress of dealing with that situation, but then all of the, the legal matters in taking over and then learning what your new role is, mm-hmm. this seems like just a huge headache. <laughs> Maybe there's ways to avoid that, right? So let's talk about some of the ways, documents that we can get into place to avoid this. If uh, somebody listening were to become mentally incapacitated or uh, needed this, uh, let's take a short break. Though, when we when we come back, we'll we'll talk about that. If you enjoy history, maybe you're just feeling a little nostalgic, or you wonder who's 
having a birthday today, or maybe you need a reason to celebrate. Well, we've got the perfect podcast for you. It is called This Is Today, and each and every day we talk about the historic events, celebrity birthdays. We also talk about whatever is going on today. There's always something to celebrate when you listen to This Is Today. And at just 10 minutes each day, you can make it a daily habit. You can even add it to your Alexa Flash briefing. Click the link in the description or just search in your favorite podcast app for This Is Today. Thanks for listening and subscribing to Learning More. This week, we are talking about conservatorships. Of course, we've heard this a lot in the news about Britney Spears and her conservatorship in which she's been going through with her dad as the conservator. Because we've, we've heard a lot in the news about what, what Britney's going through. But now hearing about this conservator role, this seems like a, a, a tough role to be in. Hearing about the amounts of documentation that you've got to read, uh, the amount of reporting that you have to do, and really the financial you know risk that, that you're taking by taking on this role. What needs to be in place in advance for a conservatorship to not have to happen? I should say first that conservatorships should only be used as a last resort. And so as you point out, it is possible to try to make plans to prevent a conservatorship from happening. So before conservatorship, I mean, as I said, conservatorship is imposed by a court. It's a public proceeding. The records, depending on the state, might be sealed, but it's still something that is quite public. So before getting there, we can each, and and I say this to my classes, we can each take steps to try to minimize the possibility of a conservatorship happening. So some of the steps, so 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 first steps are getting appropriate documents in place. Um, many of us, we, we don't want to think about what might happen to us if we become incapacitated, but car accidents happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ride my bike, bike accidents happen, and we may become incapacitated and might need someone, hopefully just temporarily in my case, to, to, to manage um, my, my financial and personal issues. First thing we can do is to create a healthcare power of attorney or healthcare advanced directives. So we can, before anything happens, sign a document that gives someone else the authority to make healthcare decisions on our behalf if we're incapacitated. If we don't do something like that, then a court might need to appoint a guardian of the person to make those healthcare decisions. Um, We can take control of that and we can decide who we would want to have make those decisions through a healthcare power of attorney or through an advanced directive that would also include a living will, what would happen um, with respect to life-preserving treatment. That's a first step. A second step is a financial power of attorney. And I should say they're called powers of attorney. You don't need an attorney involved. And the person to whom you give the authority doesn't need to be an a third, uh, doesn't need to be an attorney. So I could give my spouse a financial power of attorney to make financial decisions on my behalf if I am unable to do that. So in each of those situations, even if we're incapacitated, we've already found somebody else. We've already designated someone else. It's, it's, it's the choice we've made to have someone else make those decisions on our behalf. Another financial means of planning is to create a trust where there are financial assets at issue. An individual can create a trust, which means that this is a, it's it's a way of someone is responsible for managing your financial affairs. That person's called a mm-hmm. trustee. And uh, uh, you could create a trust. You can be the initial trustee, but your trust document can say, if I'm unable to serve as trustee, then I appoint a family member, I appoint a bank, I appoint someone else to take responsibility for my for my financial issues. And so these are these are three ways of trying to 
guard against getting into a situation where an interested person thinks that a conservator needs to be appointed. So uh, this is a great way of making those decisions for yourself instead of the court picking somebody or picking a plan for you. You've actually exactly. let your decisions, like you've you've put that down on paper in a legal document and this is yeah. your plan, what you want to do. Let me, sorry, let me just say that each state has its own forms. Generally, mm-hmm. one state will respect the forms that you've filled out in another state, but the forms are really easily available and it's just, they may require two witnesses, um, but they're pretty easy to fill mm-hmm. out. And one of the things I do in my classes is I have students look up the forms for a particular state and think about filling them out. It's never too early to start filling out those forms. Well, yeah. I mean, you look at the age of, uh, so, you know, there's Britney Spears. There's also uh, yeah, Amanda Bynes that have both uh-huh. done the conservatorship and look at how old they are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these things happened when they were very young. So I think having something like this, even at a young age in your 20s, is probably a good idea. And it, it seems like these forms are available online. So this wouldn't be a huge uh, financial setback for somebody to prepare these forms. You're absolutely right. These forms are easily available. And I think the biggest hurdle, I mean, we can all figure out how to find these forms online. The biggest hurdle is actually sitting down and saying, all right, I have to think about what's going to happen or who I want to make decisions on my own behalf if I'm unable to make them. And a lot of us don't like thinking about what would happen if we or what might happen to us in the future if we can't make these decisions ourselves. And I, I should also say it's it's important. There's also uh, who's going to who's going to manage our digital life. So um, some of the larger internet companies have created these sort of th- these decision makers, so that if you're unable to manage some of your social media accounts, you can through the social media account designate someone else to manage um, or or to make various decisions with respect to that social media account. So it's important to think not just about financial and healthcare, but also to think about who's going to access our social Mm -hmm. media accounts if we can no longer access them ourselves. God forbid we go a few days without posting a tweet. I mean, <laughs> you know, exactly. So, yes. Uh, yes. What would happen to our, to our public? Yeah. Um, I mean, come on. Post, <laughs> that post, right? Right. Um, and right. we want someone else to be able to post on, on our own behalf or we might not. Right. Um, right. But yeah, but, but thinking about digital, I mean, we tend to focus on, on healthcare and mm-hmm. on money, but also, also social media. Also. Yeah, I mean, we've we've all got a huge digital footprint now that needs yes. to be managed by somebody at some point. Uh, there's also Bitcoin or what, like all of these oh, various yeah, yeah, things yeah. that are out there that people might need access to certain e- email accounts or whatever to to access those things. the The question I have though is is about the inability. So you had said for the, you know, you can be the trustee of your trust or, you know, obviously you're going to be managing your digital assets, things like that uh, until you're unable. Who determines your inability to continue to manage those items? Well, in the case of a conservatorship, it's the court. That's pretty right. clear. Mm-hmm. You can, in setting up healthcare or financial power of attorney or trust, you can actually provide explicitly upon certification by three physicians that I am uh, unable to make my own decisions. You can set out the conditions under which you want someone else to be able to make those decisions on your behalf. So not only do you have control over who will make those decisions, Mm. you have control over the circumstances under which someone else would be able to exercise that authority. So it's really a way of exerting a great deal of control before you become incapacitated. If you don't fill out one of these forms, the, the last resort is a conservatorship, certainly for healthcare in most states. If you can't make your own decisions, there are default decision makers. That is, a state law will set out who is entitled to make decisions for you if you are unable to do that. And so, again, taking control through one of these healthcare, right. through healthcare advanced directives 
allows you to be the one saying, I want this person to be making these decisions. And these are the parameters under which I want these decisions to be made. You think about, and you mentioned people don't want to think about these things, right? They don't want to sit there and write out their their will or their advanced directive or their trust. Because I guess in many ways, once you put it on paper, it makes it reality that that is going to happen mm-hmm. potentially someday. <laughs> or that, mm-hmm. you know, yep. But I think what they don't think about is imagine on the other side of that, if something happens to you and you don't have that mm-hmm. advanced directive mm-hmm. and you've got a family member, be it your, your, your parent or your child or your spouse that has to make those decisions and, and sort of guess what you would want in that case, that's going to be a tough position for them, much more difficult than you filling out a form <laughs> while, while you're feeling right. perfectly healthy. You know, that, that at least that's how I look at it. Right. They're going to have to guess what you might want versus having you <laughs> force yourself to think about it in advance of that. Right. So, I, I, I mean, and yeah, we, we all don't want to think about it, but it, it helps prevent against situations like the one in which Britney Spears is where she doesn't, she made quite clear that she did not want the person who was managing her estate, that is, she did not want her father to continue in that role. That's not the person she seems, uh, she, she would not have chosen that person is what she seems to have indicated. You, you want to be able to take control of that before somebody else does. Had she completed something like this and planned this out in advance, and again, with her age, you know, it's like you're not thinking about that in your 20s. But if she would have done that in the the past, she could have had an exact path of who's going to take care of things, what they're going to do. And I guess even what decisions she's still able to make versus the the guardian or the person that uh, she's appointed, right? Or I guess the trustee in that case. Um, right. It's the right for, for her, right. It's, it's the conservator who seems to be making these, these decisions for her. Um, you know, it's, uh, even with the best of plans, there might be someone who could claim that the, the people acting under a, a power of attorney are not acting appropriately. So there might also be abuses in that situation. And there still might be a conservatorship that is imposed. I don't want to say, I, I don't want people to think mm-hmm. that just because you've engaged in this estate planning, there can never be a conservatorship that will be imposed. My point is to say that it's going to be a whole lot less likely for there to be a need for a conservatorship because because you've taken steps to ensure right. that everything is is managed. But a conservatorship, I mean, a court could look at the situation and decide that a conservatorship is warranted, even even with all of this estate planning. Right. Well, it, at least then, like you said earlier, try to make this the last resort. Yes. And if you have all these at least other steps in place before you get to that, you've done a better job than if you've done nothing. Right. I mean, one of the there are lots of guardianships and conservatorships are incredibly useful. But it's also important to note that there are people who are subject to conservatorships who should not be. So sometimes they're imposed where they shouldn't be. And sometimes the terms of that conservatorship are much more restrictive than they need to be. How does that happen? Well, when someone files for a conservatorship, there may be a relatively standard set of rights that are given to the conservator. And those rights might be given routinely rather than investigating the particular circumstances of the individual subject to the conservatorship. I mean, we're dealing with courts that may be under-resourced. We're dealing Mm -hmm. with situations in which the person subject to the conservatorship might not, um, uh, although uh, generally entitled to be present at the conservatorship hearing and to present evidence, may not have been able to present all of the appropriate evidence. Typically, a, a court can just grant a guardian, say, you know, you are entitled to all of the powers that are normally that are normally given under state law to a guardian, w- without, as I said, doing the particular tailoring that would be needed for any individual conservatorship. It's, it's such a 
a, a difficult topic. It's, I mean, we could probably, I mean, well, you teach entire classes. I do. <laughs> on I do. This, so it can yes. definitely go longer than a half an hour. <laughs> but you, you, you were nice enough to, to send some resources uh, uh, for each state so that somebody could go to this one website, look up some of the, the resources that they might need for some of the forums that we discussed today. So I, I thank you for that. We'll put a link to that in the podcast description. Um, I would love to talk more about this. When I when I said that I was going to bring you on to talk about uh, Britney Spears, uh, t- did you expect me to ask your favorite Britney song? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not. Okay. Well, Except do you have I a favorite? Clearly, do you have a favorite? I clearly, um, <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think we all like Toxic, right? Exactly. <laughs> that is the best. <laughs> All right, Naomi Khan is a professor of law at the University of Virginia. Hey, thank you so much for uh, putting up with me today (laughs) and joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for listening and subscribing to Learning More. We encourage you to, and thank you for rating this podcast and sharing it with your friends. As with any podcast that gives medical or legal opinion, the information is not meant to substitute professional advice. We encourage you to consult a professional to discuss your exact needs. I invite you to check out our daily podcast that I host called This Is Today, where you can learn the story of each day, national events, daily history, fun stories, and it's all right there in the description of this podcast. If you have something that you would like to learn more about, let us know. Just head over to our website, submit your ideas at learningmorepodcast.com. Again, thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. I'm Russ, and I look forward to learning more with you next time.